Today on Earth Focus, the links between biodiversity, climate, and human health. An interview with Dr. Eric Chivian of Harvard's Center for Health and the Global Environment, coming up on Earth Focus. Why do you think human health is so dependent on nature and biodiversity? Polar bears have become really iconic examples of what we will lose with global warming because the ice melts. And, and the reason that's important for polar bears is that polar bears' main food are seals. And they wait on an intact ice sheet for the seals to come up through thin areas of ice to breathe. Seals are mammals. They have to breathe air. And the polar bear grabs them and eats them. That's their main food. But with global warming, the ice is melting. So there are large areas of open water. So polar bears are starving. And for many people, that's tragic. But the medical value of losing polar bears is almost never mentioned. Polar bears and other hibernating bears have substances in their blood that prevent them from getting osteoporosis. Polar bears are essentially immobile, as every other hibernating bear is, for five to seven months. And yet they don't get osteoporosis. Their bones do not thin. They are the only mammal that doesn't get osteoporosis with prolonged immobility. If we were immobile for five months, if we were hospitalized or paralyzed, we'd lose a third of our bone mass. So with immobility, the balance shifts to losing bone, osteoporosis. This is an enormous public health problem in the United States and in the rest of the world. 70,000 people die in this country every year, cost the U.S. economy $18 billion a year. A third of women over 65, postmenopausal women, will have a vertebral fracture, not caused by injury, but caused by osteoporosis. Now, another thing about polar bears, they don't urinate for five to seven months or longer, and yet they don't get toxic, they don't get sick. If we don't get rid of our urinary waste for a few days, we're dead. There is no treatment for end-stage renal disease, for renal failure. The only thing you can do for someone whose kidney is not functioning is to dialyze them, essentially to remove the toxic waste, or to give them a new kidney, to give them a transplant. There's no medication they can take. 8% of Americans, 26 million Americans, have chronic renal disease. And that number is increasing with untreated hypertension and with obesity-related diabetes. And we have nothing to give them. But if we understood how polar bears don't get sick despite not urinating, they actually break down their urinary waste, they make new amino acids, they make new proteins. Nobody understands that. We might be able to treat or prevent even renal, chronic renal end-stage disease. One other thing, polar bears become massively obese prior to be hibernating because they need to live off their body fat. They're eating seal blubber to get that fat. And yet they don't get diabetic. When we become obese, we become diabetic. This is an epidemic disease, not only in the United States, but around the world. There are a half billion people obese around the world. About little more, uh, a greater proportion of women than men, something like 295 million women, uh, 210 or so million men. Uh, obesity has doubled in the last 30 years in the United States, and it leads to type 2 diabetes, an enormous public health problem. 20 million people have obesity-related diabetes in this country. It kills a quarter of a million people in this country every year and cost the economy $90 billion. We have no idea how polar bears prevent becoming diabetic, even though they're massively obese. We need to understand that. We have to study them in the wild. They don't hibernate in zoos or in labs. Polar bears have secrets to teach us. And if people understood that, those connections better, I think they would have a much greater value to uh, biodiversity, to ecosystems, individual species. Are there more examples besides polar bears? 
Global warming is also destroying coral reefs uh, because coral reefs are very vulnerable to temperature increases and they, they do what's called bleach and they become vulnerable to infections. One of the groups of animals that live in coral reefs are called cone snails and there are some 700 species of cone snails. Each species is thought to make at least 100 to 200 different poisons. Cone snails are predatory snails. They paralyze their prey and defend themselves by firing off a poison-coated dart, a harpoon. And then they, they bring the paralyzed organism, a fish, a, a worm, another kind of uh, mollusks, into their stomach and they digest it. That's how they live and that's how they defend themselves. So there may be 140,000 different poisons so these chemicals made by cone snails are being investigated for new medicines. There are clinical trials for new drugs for epilepsy. There are clinical trials for drugs that will protect nerve cells during strokes, heart cells during uh, heart attacks. And one of these chemicals is on the market now. It is the most important painkiller that's been discovered essentially since morphine in the early 1800s. It is a thousand times more potent than morphine. It's, it's based on one of these cone snail poisons, just one out of maybe 140,000. It's called Prealt, and it's being used for patients who no longer respond to opiates. So the problem with opiates, which are incredibly wonderful painkillers, they're the gold standard in medicine, um, is that acutely they work extremely well, but over, and over a chronic period of time, with chronic severe pain, they don't work so well. You get what's called tolerance. Your body essentially adapts to the dose, and you have to increase the dose. And eventually, for many patients, millions of patients around the world, you can't continue to increase the dose because there are other side effects like stopping breathing, or your intestines stop working, because these are some of the side effects from opiates, or the medicine doesn't work anymore for pain. So in medicine, the search for a painkiller that would be a potent painkiller like, like morphine, but not cause tolerance, has been the search for the holy grail. And this cone snail toxin is the first painkiller that has been discovered in, and is now in use that is both very potent and continues to work in patients with severe chronic pain. From this one little snail, only six of these snails has been studied in any detail. Only a hundred of these toxins have been studied in any detail. Six out of 700 species, a hundred out of 140,000 potential toxins. And some people believe cone snails may have more medicines that are important for humans than any other group of organisms on the planet. And yet, they live in coral reefs. So with global warming, if we're destroying coral reefs, we may lose the most valuable pharmacopoeia on the planet. If people understood that better, I think they would behave very differently. You edited a book about human health and biodiversity. At the end of the book, you listed maybe 10 things that people individually could do to ease the problem. That didn't seem like a lot of heavy lifting. You suggested a change of a light bulb here and turning off computers at night so they're not consuming as much energy. So many people have the sense that, what can I do as an individual? These problems are so enormous. Uh, my actions will have no no effect whatsoever. Um, but, you know, actions are cumulative and actions expand um, to other people. But the United States uses twice as much energy per capita as most countries in Europe, as Japan, as Scandinavia as countries, as Switzerland. Um, we have mega houses and mega cars and uh, as if energy is endless and has no consequences. 
So without sacrificing, we could learn to live more simply. We could learn to waste less easily. Is the only incentive you can offer people to change their behavior the promise that the effort they make will mitigate a threat that is still over the horizon? You know, I'm also a psychiatrist, and I see how hard it is for people to make changes. And they will do anything they can to prevent, uh, to avoid making a change. They even don't want to think about it very much. And these are people who are coming to me to change. So to, uh, to expect people in this country or around the world to make changes, not necessarily so much sacrifices, but even to have to think about it is work for them. People are also lazy and they don't want to, they want their work hard, they are worried about all kinds of things, they want to come home and be entertained. They don't want to read about climate change or famine in East Horn of Africa or uh, storms in the North Atlantic, they don't want to read about that stuff. I don't either, frankly. I come home, I just as soon watch the New England Patriots play football or a good movie. So it's part of our, of who we are. Um, so I think people only sometimes, I'm afraid to say, make changes when they feel they have no other choice. And I think it's partly the, the role of physicians to help them realize they have no other choice because our health and our lives depend on it. Dr. Chivian, thank you very much. My pleasure. Airwaves, a global channel of uncompromising stories. World news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.